Act Two of The Importance of Being Earnest by Oscar Wilde. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Second Act Scene Garden at the Manor House. A flight of grey stone steps leads up to the house. The garden, an old fashioned one, full of roses time of year july basket chairs and a table covered with books are set under a large yew tree miss prism discovered seated at the table cecily is at the back watering flowers cecily cecily surely such a utilitarian occupation as the watering of flowers is rather morton's duty than yours especially at a moment when intellectual pleasures await you your German grammar is on the table. Pray open it at page 15. We will repeat yesterday's lesson. Coming over very slowly. But I don't like German. It isn't at all a becoming language. I know perfectly well that I look quite plain after my German lesson. Child, you know how anxious your guardian is that you should improve yourself in every way. He laid particular stress on your German as he was leaving for town yesterday. Indeed, he always lays stress on your German when he is leaving for town. Dear Uncle Jack is so very serious. Sometimes he is so serious that I think he cannot be quite well. Drawing herself up. Your guardian enjoys the best of health, and his gravity of demeanour is especially to be commended in one so comparatively young as he is. I know no one who has a higher sense of duty and responsibility. I suppose that is why he often looks a little bored when we three are together. Cecily, I am surprised at you. Mr. Worthing has many troubles in his life. Idle merriment and triviality would be out of place in his conversation. You must remember his constant anxiety about that unfortunate young man, his brother. I wish Uncle Jack would allow that unfortunate young man, his brother, to come down here sometimes. We might have a good influence over him, Miss Prism. I am sure you certainly would. You know German and geology and things of that kind influence a man very much. Cecily begins to write in her diary. Shaking her head. I do not think that even I could produce any effect on a character that, according to his own brother's admission, is irretrievably weak and vacillating. Indeed, I am not sure that I would desire to reclaim him. I am not in favour of this modern mania for turning bad people into good people at a moment's notice. As a man sows, so let him reap. You must put away your diary, Cecily. I really don't see why you should keep a diary at all. I keep a diary in order to enter the wonderful secrets of my life. If I didn't write them down, I should probably forget all about them. Memory, my dear Cecily, is the diary that we all carry about with us. Yes, but it usually chronicles the things that have never happened and couldn't possibly have happened. I believe that memory is responsible for nearly all the three-volume novels that Moody sends us. Do not speak slightingly of the three-volume novels, Cecily. I wrote one myself in earlier days. Did you really, Miss Prism? How wonderfully clever you are. I hope it did not end happily. I don't like novels that end happily. They depress me so much. The good ended happily, and the bad unhappily. That is what fiction means. I suppose so, but it seems very unfair. And was your novel ever published? Alas, no. The manuscript, unfortunately, was abandoned. Cecily starts. I use the word in the sense of lost or mislaid. To your work, child. These speculations are profitless. Smiling. But I see dear Dr. Chasuble coming up through the garden. Rising and advancing. Dr. Chasuble. This is indeed a pleasure. Enter Canon Chasuble. Ah, and how are we this morning? Miss Prism, you are, I trust, well. Miss Prism has just been complaining of a slight headache. I think it would do her so much good to have a short stroll with you in the park, Dr. Chasuble. Cecily, I have not mentioned anything about a headache. 
No, dear Miss Prism, I know that, but I felt instinctively that you had a headache. Indeed, I was thinking about that and not about my German lesson when the rector came in. I hope, Cecily, you are not inattentive. Oh, I am afraid I am. That is strange. Were I fortunate enough to be Miss Prism's pupil, I would hang upon her lips. Miss Prism glares. I spoke metaphorically. My metaphor was drawn from bees. <coughs> Mr. Worthing, I suppose, has not returned from town yet. We do not expect him till Monday afternoon. Ah, yes, he usually likes to spend his Sunday in London. He is not one of those whose sole aim is enjoyment, as by all accounts that unfortunate young man his brother seems to be. But I must not disturb Egeria and her pupil any longer. Egeria? My name is Letitia, Doctor. Bowing. A classical allusion, merely, drawn from the pagan authors. I shall see you both, no doubt, at Evensong. I think, dear doctor, I will have a stroll with you. I find I have a headache after all, and a walk might do it good. With pleasure, Miss Prism, with pleasure. We might go as far as the schools and back. That would be delightful. Cecily? You will read your political economy in my absence. The chapter on the fall of the rupee you may omit. It is somewhat too sensational. Even these metallic problems have their melodramatic side. Goes down the garden with Dr. Chasuble. Picks up books and throws them back on the table. Horrid political economy. Horrid geography. Horrid, horrid German. Enter Merriman with a card on a salver. Mr. Ernest Worthing has just driven over from the station. He has brought his luggage with him. Takes the card and reads it. Mr. Ernest Worthing, B4 the Albany, W. Uncle Jack's brother. Did you tell him Mr. Worthing was in town? Uh, yes, miss. He seemed very much disappointed. I mentioned that you and Miss Prism were in the garden. He said he was anxious to speak to you privately for a moment. Ask Mr. Ernest Worthing to come here. I suppose you had better talk to the housekeeper about a room for him. Yes, miss. Merriman goes off. I have never met any really wicked person before. I feel rather frightened. I am so afraid he will look just like everyone else. Enter Algernon, very gay and debonair. He does. Raising his hat. You are my little cousin Cecily, I'm sure. You are under some strange mistake. I am not little. In fact, I believe I am more than usually tall for my age. Algernon is rather taken aback. But I am your cousin Cecily. You, I see from your card, are Uncle Jack's brother, my cousin Ernest. My wicked cousin Ernest. Oh, I am not really wicked at all, cousin Cecily. You mustn't think that I am wicked. If you are not, then you have certainly been deceiving us all in a very inexcusable manner. I hope you have not been leading a double life, pretending to be wicked and being really good all the time. That would be hypocrisy. Looks at her in amazement. Oh, of course I have been rather reckless. I am glad to hear it. In fact, now you mention the subject, I have been very bad in my own small way. I don't think you should be so proud of that though I am sure it must have been very pleasant. It is much pleasanter being here with you. I can't understand how you are here at all. Uncle Jack won't be back till Monday afternoon. That is a great disappointment. I am obliged to go up by the first train on Monday morning. I have a business appointment that I am anxious to miss. Couldn't you miss it anywhere but in London? No, the appointment is in London. Well, I know, of course, how important it is not to keep a business engagement, if one wants to retain any sense of the beauty of life. But still I think you had better wait till Uncle Jack arrives. I know he wants to speak to you about your emigrating. About my what? Your emigrating. He has gone up to buy your outfit. I certainly wouldn't let Jack buy my outfit. He has no taste in neckties at all. I don't think you will require neckties. Uncle Jack is sending you to Australia. Australia? 
I'd sooner die. Well, he said at dinner on Wednesday night that you would have to choose between this world, the next world, and Australia. Oh, well, the accounts I have received of Australia are the next world, and not particularly encouraging. This world is good enough for me, Cousin Cecily. Yes, but are you good enough for it? I'm afraid I'm not that. That is why I want you to reform me. You might make that your mission, if you don't mind, Cousin Cecily. I'm afraid I've no time this afternoon. Well, would you mind my reforming myself this afternoon? It is rather quixotic of you, but I think you should try. I will. I feel better already. You are looking a little worse. That is because I am hungry. How thoughtless of me! I should have remembered that when one is going to lead an entirely new life, one requires regular and wholesome meals. Won't you come in? Thank you. Might I have a buttonhole first? I never have any appetite unless I have a buttonhole first. A maréchal Niel? Picks up scissors. No, I'd sooner have a pink rose. Why? Cuts a flower. Because you are like a pink rose, Cousin Cecily. I don't think it can be right for you to talk to me like that. Miss Prism never says such things to me. Then Miss Prism is a short-sighted old lady. Cecily puts the rose in his buttonhole. You are the prettiest girl I ever saw. Miss Prism says that all good looks are a snare. They are a snare that every sensible man would like to be caught in. Oh, I don't think I would care to catch a sensible man. I shouldn't know what to talk to him about. They pass into the house. Miss Prism and Dr. Chasuble return. You are too much alone, dear Dr. Chasuble. You should get married. A misanthrope I can understand. A womanthrope, never. With a scholar's shudder. Oh, believe me, I do not deserve so neologistic a phrase. The precept as well as the practice of the primitive church was distinctly against matrimony. That is obviously the reason why the primitive church has not lasted up to the present day. And you do not seem to realise, dear doctor, that by persistently remaining single, a man converts himself into a permanent public temptation. Men should be more careful. This very celibacy leads weaker vessels astray. But is a man not equally attractive when married? No married man is ever attractive except to his wife. And often, I've been told, not even to her. That depends on the intellectual sympathies of the woman. Maturity can always be depended on. Ripeness can be trusted. Young women are green. Dr. Chasuble starts. I spoke horticulturally. My metaphor was drawn from fruits. But where is Cecily? Perhaps she followed us to the schools. Enter Jack, slowly, from the back of the garden. He is dressed in the deepest mourning, with crepe hatband and black gloves. Mr. Worthing! Mr. Worthing! This is indeed a surprise. We did not look for you till Monday afternoon. Shakes Miss Prism's hand in a tragic manner. I have returned sooner than I expected, Dr. Chasuble. I hope you are well. Dear Mr. Worthing, I trust this garb of woe does not betoken some terrible calamity. My brother. More shameful debts and extravagance? Still leading his life of pleasure. Shaking his head. Dead. Your brother Ernest dead. Quite dead. What a lesson for him. I trust he will profit by it. Mr. Worthing, I offer you my sincere condolence. You have at least the consolation of knowing that you were always the most generous and forgiving of brothers. Poor Ernest. He had many faults. But it is a sad, sad blow. Very sad indeed. Were you with him at the end? No, he died abroad. In Paris, in fact. I had a telegram last night from the manager of the Grand Hotel. Was the cause of death mentioned? A severe chill, it seems. As a man sows, so shall he reap. Raising his hand. Charity, dear Miss Prism, charity. 
none of us are perfect i myself am peculiarly susceptible to draughts will the interment take place here no he seems to have expressed a desire to be buried in paris in paris shakes his head i fear that hardly points to any serious state of mind at the last you would no doubt wish me to make some slight allusion to this tragic domestic affliction next sunday jack presses his hand convulsively my sermon on the meaning of the manner in the wilderness can be adapted to almost any occasion joyful or as in the present case distressing all sigh i have preached it at harvest celebrations christenings confirmations on days of humiliation and festal days the last time i delivered it was in the cathedral as a charity sermon on behalf of the society for the prevention of discontent among the upper orders the bishop who was present was much struck by some of the analogies i drew ah that reminds me you mentioned christenings i think dr chasuble i suppose you know how to christen all right dr chasuble looks astounded i mean of course you are continually christening aren't you it is i regret to say one of the rector's most constant duties in this parish i have often spoken to the poorer classes on the subject but they don't seem to know what thrift is but is there any particular infant in whom you are interested mr worthing your brother was i believe unmarried was he not oh yes people who live entirely for pleasure usually are but it is not for any child dear doctor i am very fond of children no the fact is i would like to be christened myself this afternoon if you have nothing better to do but surely mr worthing you have been christened already i don't remember anything about it but have you any grave doubts on the subject i certainly intend to have of course i don't know if the thing would bother you in any way or if you think i am a little too old now not at all the sprinkling and indeed the immersion of adults is a perfectly canonical practice immersion ah, you need have no apprehensions sprinkling is all that is necessary or indeed i think advisable our weather is so changeable at what hour would you wish the ceremony performed oh i might trot round about five if that would suit you perfectly perfectly in fact i have two similar ceremonies to perform at that time a case of twins that occurred recently in one of the outlying cottages on your own estate poor jenkins the carter a most hard-working man oh i don't see much fun in being christened along with other babies it would be childish would half past five do admirably admirably takes out watch ah and now dear mr worthing i will not intrude any longer into a house of sorrow i would merely beg you not to be too much bowed down by grief what seem to us bitter trials are often blessings in disguise this seems to me a blessing of an extremely obvious kind enter cecily from the house uncle jack oh i am pleased to see you back but what horrid clothes you have got on do go and change them cecily my child my child cecily goes towards jack he kisses her brow in a melancholy manner what is the matter uncle jack do look happy you look as if you had toothache and i have got such a surprise for you who do you think is in the dining-room your brother who your brother ernest he arrived about half an hour ago what nonsense i haven't got a brother oh don't say that however badly he may have behaved to you in the past he is still your brother you couldn't be so heartless as to disown him i'll tell him to come out and you will shake hands with him won't you uncle jack runs back into the house these are very joyful tidings after we had all been resigned to his loss his sudden return seems to me peculiarly distressing 
My brother is in the dining room. I don't know what it all means. I think it is perfectly absurd. Enter Algernon and Cecily hand in hand. They come slowly up to Jack. Good heavens! Motions Algernon away. Brother John, I have come down from town to tell you that I am very sorry for all the trouble I have given you, and that I intend to lead a better life in the future. Jack glares at him and does not take his hand. Uncle Jack, you are not going to refuse your own brother's hand. Nothing will induce me to take his hand. I think his coming down here disgraceful. He knows perfectly well why. Uncle Jack, do be nice. There is some good in every one. Ernest has just been telling me about his poor invalid friend Mr. Bunbury, whom he goes to visit so often. And surely there must be much good in one who is kind to an invalid, and leaves the pleasures of London to sit by a bed of pain. Oh, he has been talking about Bunbury, has he? Yes, he has told me all about poor Mr. Bunbury and his terrible state of health. Bunbury! Well, I won't have him talk to you about Bunbury, or about anything else. It is enough to drive one perfectly frantic. Of course, I admit that the faults were all on my side, but I must say that I think that Brother John's coldness to me is peculiarly painful. I expected a more enthusiastic welcome, especially considering it is the first time I have come here. Uncle Jack, if you don't shake hands with Ernest, I will never forgive you. Never forgive me? Never, never, never. Well, this is the last time I shall ever do it. Shakes with Algernon and glares. It's pleasant, is it not, to see so perfect a reconciliation? I think we might leave the two brothers together. Cecily, you will come with us. Certainly, Miss Prism. My little task of reconciliation is over. You have done a beautiful action today, dear child. We must not be premature in our judgments. I feel very happy. They all go off except Jack and Algernon. You young scoundrel, Algy. You must get out of this place as soon as possible. I don't allow any bunbring here. Enter Merriman. I have put Mr. Ernest's things in the room next to yours, sir. I suppose that is all right. What? Uh, Mr. Ernest's luggage, sir. I have unpacked it and put it in the room next to your own. His luggage? Uh, yes, sir. Three portmanteaus, a dressing case, two hat boxes, and a large luncheon basket. I am afraid I can't stay more than a week this time. Merriman, order the dog cart at once. Mr. Ernest has been suddenly called back to town. Yes, sir. Goes back into the house. What a fearful liar you are, Jack. I have not been called back to town at all. Yes, you have. I haven't heard anyone call me. Your duty as a gentleman calls you back. My duty as a gentleman has never interfered with my pleasures in the smallest degree. I can quite understand that. Well, Cecily is a darling. You are not to talk of Miss Cardew like that. I don't like it. Well, I don't like your clothes. You look perfectly ridiculous in them. Why on earth don't you go up and change? It is perfectly childish to be in deep mourning for a man who is actually staying for a whole week with you in your house as a guest. I call it grotesque. You are certainly not staying with me for a whole week as a guest, or anything else. You have got to leave by the 4-5 train. I certainly won't leave you so long as you are in mourning. It would be most unfriendly. If I were in mourning, you would stay with me, I suppose. I should think it very unkind if you didn't. Well, will you go if I change my clothes? Yes, if you are not too long. I never saw anybody take so long to dress, and with such little result. Well, at any rate, that is better than being always overdressed as you are. If I am occasionally a little overdressed, I make up for it by always being immensely over-educated. Your vanity is ridiculous. Your conduct an outrage and your presence in my garden utterly absurd. However, you have got to catch to four five, and I hope you will have a pleasant journey back to town. This bunburying, as you call it, has not been a great success for you. Goes into the house. I think it has been a great success. I'm in love with Cecily, and that is everything. Enter Cecily at the back of the garden. She picks up the can and begins to water the flowers. But I must see her before I go, and make arrangements for another Bunbury. Ah, there she is. Oh, I merely came back to water the roses. 
I thought you were with Uncle Jack. He's gone to water the dog cart for me. Oh, is he going to take you for a nice drive? He's going to send me away. Then have we got to part? I'm afraid so. It is a very painful parting. It is always painful to part from people whom one has known for a very brief space of time. The absence of old friends one can endure with equanimity. But even a momentary separation from anyone to whom one has just been introduced is almost unbearable. Thank you. Enter Merriman. The dog cart is at the door, sir. Algernon looks appealingly at Cecily. It can wait, Merriman, for five minutes. Yes, miss. Exit Merriman. I hope, Cecily, I shall not offend you if I state quite frankly and openly that you seem to me to be in every way the visible personification of absolute perfection. I think your frankness does you great credit, Ernest. If you will allow me, I will copy your remarks into my diary. Goes over to the table and begins writing in diary. Do you really keep a diary? I'd give anything to look at it. Uh, may I? Oh, no. Puts her hand over it. You see, it is simply a very young girl's record of her own thoughts and impressions, and consequently meant for publication. When it appears in volume form, I hope you'll order a copy. But pray, Ernest, don't stop. I delight in taking down from dictation. I have reached absolute perfection. You can go on. I am quite ready for more. Somewhat taken aback. <clears throat> oh, don't cough, Ernest. When one is dictating, one should speak fluently and not cough. Besides, I don't know how to spell a cough. Writes as Algernon speaks. Cecily, ever since I first looked upon your wonderful and incomparable beauty, I have dared to love you wildly, passionately, devotedly, hopelessly. I don't think that you should tell me that you love me wildly, passionately, devotedly, hopelessly. Hopelessly doesn't seem to make much sense, does it? Cecily! Enter Merriman. <clears throat> the dog-cart is waiting, sir. Tell it to come round next week at the same hour. Looks at Cecily, who makes no sign. Yes, sir. Merriman retires. Uncle Jack would be very much annoyed if he knew you were staying on till next week at the same hour. Oh, I don't care about Jack. I don't care for anybody in the whole world but you. I love you, Cecily. You will marry me, won't you? You silly boy. Of course. Why, we have been engaged for the last three months. For the last three months? Yes, it will be exactly three months on Thursday. But how did we become engaged? Well, ever since dear Uncle Jack first confessed to us that he had a younger brother who was very wicked and bad, you, of course, have formed the chief topic of conversation between myself and Miss Prism. And, of course, a man who is much talked about is always very attractive. One feels there must be something in him after all. I dare say it was foolish of me, but I fell in love with you, Ernest. Darling, and when was the engagement actually settled? On the 14th of February last. Worn out by your entire ignorance of my existence, I determined to end the matter one way or the other and after a long struggle with myself I accepted you, under this dear old tree here. The next day I bought this little ring in your name, and this is the little bangle with the true lover's knot I promised you always to wear. Did I give you this? It's very pretty, isn't it? Yes, you've wonderfully good taste, Ernest. It's the excuse I've always given for your leading such a bad life. And this is the box in which I keep all your dear letters. Kneels at table opens box, and produces letters tied up with blue ribbon. My letters! But, my own sweet Cecily, I have never written you any letters. You need hardly remind me of that, Ernest. I remember only too well that I was forced to write your letters for you. I wrote always three times a week, and sometimes oftener. Oh, do let me read them, Cecily. Oh, I couldn't possibly. They would make you far too conceited replaces box the three you wrote me after i'd broken off the engagement are so beautiful and so badly spelled that even now i can hardly read them without crying a little but was our engagement ever broken off of course it was on the twenty-second of last march you can see the entry if you like shows diary today i broke off my engagement with ernest i feel it is better to do so the weather still continues charming 
but why on earth did you break it off what had i done i had done nothing at all cecily i am very much hurt indeed to hear you broke it off particularly when the weather was so charming it would hardly have been a really serious engagement if it hadn't been broken off at least once but i forgave you before the week was out crossing to her and kneeling what a perfect angel you are cecily you dear romantic boy he kisses her she puts her fingers through his hair i hope your hair curls naturally does it yes darling with a little help from others i'm so glad you'll never break off our engagement again cecily i don't think i could break it off now that i've actually met you besides of course there is the question of your name yes of course you must not laugh at me darling but it had always been a girlish dream of mine to love someone whose name was ernest algernon rises cecily also there is something in that name that seems to inspire absolute confidence i pity any poor married woman whose husband is not called ernest but my dear child do you mean to say you could not love me if i had some other name but what name oh any name you like algernon for instance but i don't like the name of algernon well my own dear sweet loving little darling i really can't see why you should object to the name of algernon it is not a bad name in fact it is rather an aristocratic name half of the chaps who get into the bankruptcy court are called algernon but seriously cecily moving to her if my name was algy couldn't you love me rising i might respect you ernest i might admire your character but i fear that i should not be able to give you my undivided attention <clears throat> cecily your rector here is i suppose thoroughly experienced in the practice of all the rites and ceremonials of the church oh yes dr chasuble is a most learned man he has never written a single book so you can imagine how much he knows i must see him at once on a most important christening i mean on most important business oh i shan't be away more than half an hour considering that we have been engaged since february the fourteenth and that i only met you to-day for the first time i think it is rather hard that you should leave me for so long a period as half an hour couldn't you make it twenty minutes i'll be back in no time kisses her and rushes down the garden what an impetuous boy he is i like his hair so much i must enter his proposal in my diary enter merriman a uh, miss fairfax has just called to see mr worthing on very important business miss fairfax states isn't mr worthing in his library mr worthing went over in the direction of the rectory some time ago pray ask the lady to come out here mr worthing is sure to be back soon and you can bring tea yes miss goes out miss fairfax i suppose one of the many good elderly women who are associated with uncle jack in some of his philanthropic work in london i don't quite like women who are interested in philanthropic work i think it is so forward of them enter merriman <clears throat> miss fairfax enter gwendolen exit merriman advancing to meet her pray let me introduce myself to you my name is cecily cardew cecily cardew moving to her and shaking hands what a very sweet name something tells me that we are going to be great friends i like you already more than i can say my first impressions of people are never wrong how nice of you to like me so much after we have known each other such a comparatively short time pray sit down still standing up i may call you cecily may i not with pleasure and you will always call me gwendolen won't you if you wish then that is all quite settled is it not i hope so a pause they both sit down together perhaps this might be a favourable opportunity for my mentioning who i am my father is lord bracknell you have never heard of papa i suppose i don't think so outside the family circle papa i am glad to say is entirely unknown i think that is quite as it should be the home seems to me the proper sphere for the man and certainly once a man begins to neglect his domestic duties he becomes painfully effeminate does he not and i don't like that it makes men so very attractive 
Cecily, Mamma, whose views on education are remarkably strict, has brought me up to be extremely short-sighted. It is part of her system. So do you mind my looking at you through my glasses? Oh, not at all, Gwendolen. I am very fond of being looked at. After examining Cecily carefully through a lorgnette. You are here on a short visit, I suppose? Oh, no. I live here. Really? Your mother, no doubt, or some female relative of advanced years resides here also? Oh, no. I have no mother, nor, in fact, any relations. Indeed? My dear guardian, with the assistance of Miss Prism, has the arduous task of looking after me. Your guardian? Yes. I am Mr. Worthing's ward. Oh. It is strange he never mentioned to me that he had a ward. How secretive of him! He grows more interesting hourly. I am not sure, however, that the news inspires me with feelings of unmixed delight. I am very fond of you, Cecily. I have liked you ever since I met you. But I am bound to state that now I know you are Mr. Worthing's ward, I cannot help expressing a wish you were, well, just a little older than you seem to be, and not quite so very alluring in appearance. In fact, if I may speak candidly— Pray do. I think that whenever one has anything unpleasant to say, one should always be quite candid. Well, to speak with perfect candour, Cecily, I wish that you were fully forty-two and more than usually plain for your age. Ernest has a strong, upright nature. He is the very soul of truth and honour. Disloyalty would be as impossible to him as deception. But even men of the noblest possible moral character are extremely susceptible to the influence of the physical charms of others. Modern, no less than ancient history, supplies us with many most painful examples of what I refer to. If it were not so, indeed, history would be quite unreadable. I beg your pardon, Gwendolen. Did you say Ernest? Yes. Oh, but it is not Mr. Ernest Worthing who is my guardian. It is his brother, his elder brother. Ernest never mentioned to me that he had a brother. I am sorry to say they have not been on good terms for a long time. Ah, that accounts for it. And now that I think of it, I have never heard any man mention his brother. The subject seems distasteful to most men. Oh, Cecily, you have lifted a load from my mind. I was growing almost anxious. It would have been terrible if any cloud had come across a friendship like ours, would it not? Of course, you are quite, quite sure that it is not Mr. Ernest Worthing who is your guardian? Quite sure. In fact, I am going to be his. I beg your pardon? Dearest Gwendolen, there is no reason why I should make a secret of it to you. Our little county newspaper is sure to chronicle the fact next week. Mr. Ernest Worthing and I are engaged to be married. Quite politely, rising. My darling Cecily, I think there must be some slight error. Mr. Ernest Worthing is engaged to me. The announcement will appear in the morning post on Saturday at the latest. Very politely, rising. I am afraid you must be under some misconception. Ernest proposed to me exactly ten minutes ago. Shows diary. Examines diary through her lorgnette carefully. It is certainly very curious, for he asked me to be his wife yesterday afternoon at five-thirty. If you would care to verify the incident, pray do so. Produces diary of her own. I never travel without my diary. One should always have something sensational to read in the train. I am so sorry, dear Cecily, if it is any disappointment to you, but I am afraid I have the prior claim. It would distress me more than I can tell you, dear Gwendolen, if it caused you any mental or physical anguish, but I feel bound to point out that since Ernest proposed to you, he clearly has changed his mind. If the poor fellow has been entrapped into any foolish promise, I shall consider it my duty to rescue him at once, and with a firm hand. Whatever unfortunate entanglement my dear boy may have got into, I will never reproach him with it after we are married. Do you allude to me, Miss Cardew, as an entanglement? You are presumptuous. On an occasion of this kind it becomes more than a moral duty to speak one's mind. 
it becomes a pleasure do you suggest miss fairfax that i entrapped ernest into an engagement how dare you this is no time for wearing the shallow mask of manners when i see a spade i call it a spade i am glad to say that i have never seen a spade it is obvious that our social spheres have been widely different enter merriman followed by the footman he carries a salver tablecloth and plate stand cecily is about to retort the presence of the servants exercises a restraining influence under which both girls chafe shall i lay tea here as usual miss yes as usual merriman begins to clear table and lay cloth a long pause cecily and gwendolen glare at each other are there many interesting walks in the vicinity miss cardew oh yes a great many from the top of one of the hills quite close one can see five counties five counties i don't think i should like that i hate crowds i suppose that is why you live in town gwendolen bites her lip and beats her foot nervously with her parasol looking round quite a well-kept garden this is miss cardew so glad you like it miss fairfax i had no idea there were any flowers in the country oh flowers are as common here miss fairfax as people are in london personally i cannot understand how anybody manages to exist in the country if anybody who is anybody does the country always bores me to death ah this is what the newspapers call agricultural depression is it not i believe the aristocracy are suffering very much from it just at present it is almost an epidemic amongst them i have been told may i offer you some tea miss fairfax thank you aside detestable girl but i require tea sugar no thank you sugar is not fashionable any more cecily looks angrily at her takes up the tongs and puts four lumps of sugar into the cup cake or bread and butter bread and butter please cake is rarely seen at the best houses nowadays cuts a very large slice of cake and puts it on the tray hand that to miss fairfax merriman does so and goes out with footman gwendolen drinks the tea and makes a grimace puts down cup at once reaches out her hand to the bread and butter looks at it and finds it is cake rises in indignation you have filled my tea with lumps of sugar and though i asked most distinctly for bread and butter you have given me cake i am known for the gentleness of my disposition and the extraordinary sweetness of my nature but i warn you miss cardew you may go too far rising to save my poor innocent trusting boy from the machinations of any other girl there are no lengths to which i would not go from the moment i saw you i distrusted you i felt that you were false and deceitful i am never deceived in such matters my first impressions of people are invariably right it seems to me miss fairfax that i am trespassing on your valuable time no doubt you have many other calls of a similar character to make in the neighbourhood enter jack catching sight of him ernest my own ernest gwendolen darling offers to kiss her draws back a moment may i ask if you are engaged to be married to this young lady points to cecily <laughs> to dear little cecily of course not what could have put such an idea into your pretty little head thank you you may offers her cheek i knew there must be some misunderstanding miss fairfax the gentleman whose arm is at present round your waist is my guardian mr john worthing i beg your pardon this is uncle jack receding jack oh enter algernon here is ernest goes straight over to cecily without noticing any one else my own love offers to kiss her drawing back a moment ernest may i ask you are you engaged to be married to this young lady looking round to what young lady good heavens gwendolen yes to good heavens gwendolen i mean to gwendolen <laughs> of course not what could have put such an idea into your pretty little head thank you presenting her cheek to be kissed you may algernon kisses her 
I felt that there was some slight error, Miss Cardew. The gentleman who is now embracing you is my cousin, Mr. Algernon Moncrief. Breaking away from Algernon. Algernon Moncrief! Oh! The two girls move towards each other and put their arms round each other's waists, as if for protection. Are you called Algernon? I cannot deny it. Oh! Is your name really John? Standing rather proudly. I could deny it if I liked. I could deny anything if I liked. But my name certainly is John. It has been John for years. To Gwendolen. A gross deception has been practised on both of us. My poor wounded Cecily. My sweet wronged Gwendolen. You will call me sister, will you not? They embrace. Jack and Algernon groan and walk up and down. There is just one question I would like to be allowed to ask my guardian. An admirable idea. Mr. Worthing, there is just one question I would like to be permitted to put to you. Where is your brother Ernest? We are both engaged to be married to your brother Ernest, so it is a matter of some importance to us to know where your brother Ernest is at present. Gwendolen, Cecily, it is very painful for me to be forced to speak the truth. It is the first time in my life that I have ever been reduced to such a painful position, and I am really quite inexperienced in doing anything of the kind. However, I will tell you quite frankly that I have no brother Ernest. I have no brother at all. I never had a brother in my life, and I certainly have not the smallest intention of ever having one in the future. No brother at all? None. Had you never a brother of any kind? Never. Not even of any kind. I am afraid it is quite clear, Cecily, that neither of us is engaged to be married to any one. It is not a very pleasant position for a young girl suddenly to find herself in, is it? Let us go into the house. They will hardly venture to come after us there. No, men are so cowardly, aren't they? They retire into the house with scornful looks. This ghastly state of things is what you call bunbring, I suppose. Yes, and a perfectly wonderful Bunbury it is, the most wonderful Bunbury I have ever had in my life. Well, you have no right whatsoever to Bunbury here. That is absurd. One has a right to Bunbury anywhere one chooses. Every serious Bunburyist knows that. Serious Bunburyist? Good heavens! Well, one must be serious about something if one wants to have any amusement in life. I happen to be serious about Bunburying. What on earth you are serious about, I haven't got the remotest idea. About everything, I should fancy. You have such an absolutely trivial nature. Well, the only small satisfaction I have in the whole of this wretched business is that your friend de Bunbury is quite exploded. You won't be able to run down to the country quite so often as you used to do, dear Algy. And a very good thing, too. Your brother is a little off colour, isn't he, dear Jack? You won't be able to disappear to London quite so frequently as your wicked custom was, and not a bad thing either. As for your conduct towards Miss Cardew, I must say that your taking in a sweet, simple, innocent girl like that is quite inexcusable, to say nothing of the fact that she is my ward. I can see no possible defence at all for your deceiving a brilliant, clever, thoroughly experienced young lady like Miss Fairfax, to say nothing of the fact that she is my cousin. I want her to be engaged to Gwendolen. That is all. I love her. Well, I simply wanted to be engaged to Cecily. I adore her. There is certainly no chance of your marrying Miss Cardew. I don't think there is much likelihood, Jack, of you and Miss Fairfax being united. Well, that is no business of yours. If it was my business, I wouldn't talk about it. Begins to eat muffins. It is very vulgar to talk about one's business. Only people like stockbrokers do that, and then merely at dinner parties. How can you sit there calmly eating muffins, when we are in this horrible trouble I can't make out? You seem to me to be perfectly heartless. Well, I can't eat muffins in an agitated manner. The butter would probably get on my cuffs. One should always eat muffins quite calmly. It is the only way to eat them. I say it's perfectly heartless you're eating muffins at all, under the circumstances. When I am in trouble, eating is the only thing that consoles me. Indeed, 
when i am in really great trouble as any one who knows me intimately will tell you i refuse everything except food and drink at the present moment i am eating muffins because i am unhappy besides i am particularly fond of muffins well that is no reason why you should eat them all in that greedy way takes muffins from algernon offering tea cake i wish you would have tea cake instead i don't like tea cake good heavens i suppose a man may eat his own muffins in his own garden but you have just said it was perfectly heartless to eat muffins i said it was perfectly heartless of you under the circumstances that is a very different thing that may be but the muffins are the same he seizes the muffin dish from jack algy i wish to goodness you would go you can't possibly ask me to go without having some dinner it's absurd i never go without my dinner no one ever does except vegetarians and people like that besides i have just made arrangements with dr chaucible to be christened at a quarter to six under the name of ernest my dear fellow the sooner you give up that nonsense the better i made arrangements this morning with dr chasuble to be christened myself at five-thirty and i naturally will take the name of ernest gwendolen would wish it we can't both be christened ernest it's absurd besides i have a perfect right to be christened if i like there is no evidence at all that i have ever been christened by anybody i should think it extremely probable i never was and so does dr chasuble it is entirely different in your case you have been christened already yes but i have not been christened for years yes but you have been christened that is the important thing quite so so i know my constitution can stand it if you are not quite sure about your ever having been christened i must say i think it is rather dangerous your venturing on it now it might make you very unwell you can hardly have forgotten that some one very closely connected with you was very nearly carried off this week in paris by a severe chill yes but you said yourself that a severe chill was not hereditary it usen't to be i know but i dare say it is now science is always making wonderful improvements in things picking up the muffin dish oh that is nonsense you are always talking nonsense jack you are at the muffins again i wish you wouldn't there are only two left takes them i told you i was particularly fond of muffins but i hate tea cake why on earth then do you allow tea cake to be served up for your guests what ideas you have of hospitality algernon i have already told you to go i don't want you here why don't you go i haven't quite finished my tea yet and there is still one muffin left jack groans and sinks into a chair algernon still continues eating end of act two 